All right, so today is going to be a, a new lecture that I, we haven't done in previous semesters. Um, and it really is, you know, th there was only one paper listed because there's kind of only one paper that does this awesome thing we're going to talk about. Um, but the general idea here, we want to talk about the, the, the notion of, of taking logic we normally have running in our application server and embedding it inside of, of the database system. And we do this for performance reasons. So uh, the background is going to be, we'll talk about the, uh, we'll start with the background about why you want to do this. It means the, the paper sort of lays out the, the reasons why it's sort of obvious, but just to understand what's going on. Um, and then we'll talk about the Freud technique, which is again the, the main thing we want to focus on, because in my opinion, it is actually the, it's probably one of the best papers written in the last two or three years in databases. The impact is like significant. Like you see the numbers, they say, oh, it's like 500x improvement. Like you get that for free. Right, without having to like buy new hardware or without having to rewrite your application. So to me, like it's very rare you see five five hundred x improvement uh, for you know like out of the box like that. So that's why I, I'm super excited about this paper. Um, but then I'm going to finish up talking if we, have, if we have time remaining, just talking about like some general tips about going forward working on your project uh, this semester, like and and beyond this class and you know in your career. The general tips that I've sort of uh, sort of looked is some of these other opinions. Some of these are based on my own experiences about how to get started working on large software code projects, right? Because again, it's 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 sort of what we're trying to do in this class: teach you guys not only the database things, but also sort of software engineering things on the practical side. Okay. All right. So up until now, uh, everything we talked about in the class has really been assuming that the all the logic about what the application wants to do with data is embedded inside the database system itself, right? We'll be able to run queries to answer questions uh, that the, the that people may have, but like what they actually do with those answers and how they actually modify your the the or how to actually apply them inside the application itself, all that runs on the, the the client side, right? Whether it's PHP code, Java code, Ruby code, we don't care. That's running over there, and our database is only interacting. Uh, uh, it's only interacting with a client through through SQL, All right? And this is because uh, you know if you're using the conversational APIs we talked about, JDBC, ODBC, it's basically you're just asking the data system to give you data, it gives you back response, and you ask it to store some data, and it tells you whether that succeeded or not, right? So it, again, it looks like this: you have on the application server, you have say some transaction, and it's going to be a combination of SQL intermixed with program logic. So in program logic, it would be the imperative code that it would, it would be in, your, in like a UDS, right? If branches, while loops, for loops, maybe calls to other things in, in the world, right? And so when the transaction starts, we invoke a SQL statement, it sends it over to the, to the, to the, the database server, who then parses the plans, it optimizes, and does the query execution. We get back a result, and then the, then the database system stalls, waiting for the next, next query request, because now the application server is executing some additional program logic. So in, in between this back and forth, the system is, the database system has to wait to know what you're going to do next. And we're not going to be holding latches because you don't hold them for long periods. We're, we could be holding locks on tuples and records and objects in our database system. And we only can then free them actually when we go ahead and commit. So the idea of embedding database logic, we're going to take some of the code that we had in the application server, and now we don't want to run that inside the database system. Right? We can either do this through like an RPC, uh, through store procedures, which I'll show in the next slide, or we can do it through the user-defined functions or UDS that was in the paper that, that you guys read about. Right? And the idea here is this, we want to avoid having to do these, these back and forth round trips between the application server and the database server, because ideally we want to have the, the database system, you know, uh, we, want the, we want to run our logic close to where the data is, uh, is actually stored. Right? So just again, look, look in this example here, if we just take all of this, we can embed that inside the database system as a, as a store procedure. Now in our application code, the only thing we have is just this invocation call and other systems, the SQL, the, the SQL you call exec or execute. Right now we just invoke this function, pass in some arguments, and then this thing gets executed directly inside the, inside the database system. So again, this is an example of a store procedure. A store procedure can be run as a standalone function user divine functions have to be invoked with, as a part of a SQL statement. So let's go into detail now of what, what is actually going on in the user defined function. 
So a user defined function, UDF, is something that the application developer is going to write. And the idea here is that we want to extend the capabilities or the functionality of the database system to now include additional things that we write in our, you know, that, that we write in, in our UDF. And again, it's just a basic function, right? You take in some bunch of input arguments, and these are gonna be scalars, you do some kind of computation, right? and that computation could be you do the standard imperative code things like for loops, if clauses, while loops, could be invocations of other SQL statements, could be invocations of other functions, right? It's all the things you would get normally could do in, in, in your application program. We can now do this inside of, of a UDF. And then it has a return result. And the result could either be another scalar or it could be a, uh, a set of tables or a set of tuples, right? So again, the reason why we're going to do this is because these, there are certain things that are difficult to express in SQL that we may want to run inside of our database system, and we can use user-defined functions as a way to do this. Excuse me. So let's, let's look at an example here. So this is a, uh, a user-defined function called customer level. And so in this example here, we're going to be based everything on T-SQL. T-SQL is the variant of U the UDF language that um, SQL Server supports. It actually came from Sybase. So SQL Server is a fork of Sybase. In the 19, like 1992, 93, they Microsoft bought a copy of the source code or licensed the source code from Sybase to port it to Windows NT. Then they rebranded it as, as SQL Server. And then Sybase sort of went off and, not, yeah, I guess it sort of stagnated. Uh, and then, since then, it got bought by SAP. Um, whereas, like SQL Server is like still is like state of the art now. Like they're you know they're adding new stuff all the time, as, as you guys see from this paper. So the SQL standard is is, is SQL PGM, uh, but nobody actually implements that directly. It'll be you know in in Postgres it's PLPG SQL or in Oracle it's PL SQL. It all roughly looks the same, right? But the the, the exact syntax is slightly different. So. We have a function here called customer level. We're going to take in a customer key as an integer, um, and we're going to turn a, uh, a, a 10 character char, right? So we always have to declare our variables ahead of time. I don't I mean, I don't want to teach you UDF language here. I'm just showing you what it does. So this is like Pascal or Ada, if you're familiar with those older languages. You declare your variables at the very top, and you can't declare them at the bottom. You have to, everything has to be at the top. So I'm going to declare two variables. Now I do a select statement that wants to compute the total amount of uh, of items that th this customer has purchased. And then based on that total amount, I'll tell you whether they're at the platinum customer level, therefore they get preferential treatment, or they're, just, they're a regular customer. And then I return back that, that string I just computed. So if I want to say for every single customer, give me their customer level, I, I, I can include my UDF here in my output or our projection list for my select statement. And then as this iterates over, over every single customer, uh, we pass in the customer key for that row, invoke this function, which then invokes, um, sorry, then invokes more queries, right, these up here, and then returns back the result, right? But again, so this is, this is you could implement this all in SQL, but by putting this in, in a UDF, it makes it sort of easier to program now because it's, again, a single function call. So why, again, I've already said why you want to do this, but let's go get into more detail, right? So Again, the, you have this nice modularity in code reuse where now not every single, uh, you know, every single SQL function that maybe needs to know what's the customer level for every single customer, you just invoke that function. You don't have to re-implement that logic of essentially if computing the total and then having the if clause for every single query, right? You just have the function and everybody can invoke it. Um, it reduces the number, the, ne the number of network round trips. In that last example, I, we, could, we could rewrite that as, as a single query. But in other cases, right, if you have um, more complex logic, you may have to go back and forth in the application unless you can embed it in the UDF. Um, and then from, from, a, from a, just sort of an engineering standpoint, it's way easier in many cases to actually just write and read UDFs because most of your programmers are going to be know how to write JavaScript, Python, uh, and, and C++ code. A lot of them are not going to know how to write uh, the, real, the more complex you know, uh, UDF code. In my example here, it was pretty, pretty easy to read, but you, you can imagine there's more arcane uh, aspects of this language, especially if you don't know Pascal or Ada already, that may trip up users, right? All right, so these, these are showing you, again, these are examples of why you want to do this, and there's clear, clear benefits of this. But what are the problems, right? Where do things go bad? 
What, what, did, what did the Freud paper talk about? What's that? Efficiency, Efficiency is probably the, the biggest one, right? But why, why are UDFs inefficient? When you look at your previous query, it does, you know, if you're, select, if you're doing it across all the customers, it runs an individual sum uh, SQL query for each customer when you could have done it by a single group by and join. Right, perfect. So he said, in this function, we have a select statement that computes just the, the total sum of, of, of the, the, the items purchased for, all customer, for, for a single customer. But that means that every single time I invoke this, I'm invoking this function over and over again. That means like, again, setting up a query is not it's, not, it's not expensive, but it's not cheap, right? You set up a cursor, you allocate some memory, right? Then you have to do the lookup of the customer key. Instead, I could just do a sequential scan if I did this for everyone and then computed it for, uh, you know, for in total. And then now I just do my join based on the, the total, you know, the table I've computed already. Whereas this thing is invoking this, this query every single time for every single customer. Right, so the first issue is going to be sort of what he said about, well, that's on the next slide, but about the, the, the execution cost. But even before you start getting to, to executing it, the, the query optimizer is not going to know anything about what's inside your UDF. Right, because it's not declarative; it's imperative, meaning it's you're telling the database system, "Here's the, the here's the logic I want you to execute," not, and then SQL is like, "Here's the answer I want you to compute for me." So the query optimizer can't reason anything about what your program is going to do because it's going, you know, it, it's not going to know what branch you're going to go down in your if clause because it doesn't know what data it's actually looking at until you actually invoke it. Right, going back here, I don't know what this thing is going to compute. Right? I, I don't know whether I'm going to be a platinum or a regular customer until I get the answer of this. But I can't get the answer of this until I obviously compute the answer. Right? So we can't, the optimizer can't optimize anything down here because it doesn't know which path it's going to take. Right? So it's basically going to treat the UDEF as a black box. I think the paper talks about how they, uh, they just assume that the, like the cost is almost, almost zero, but in many cases that's, that's not the case. The other issue is going to be now that the, they're going to be difficult to paralyze because you're essentially just going to be executing uh, you know, the, the steps one after another. Um, and you can't reason about any of the queries that are inside of them and therefore try to do optimization across mul multiple queries inside the same UDF. So like, you're in the same execution context. You're, ex you're executing UDF as part of the same query. And you may be looking at you know, you know, for or a single record in your table, if you know you have a bunch of queries that are all going to be operating on the same tuple, then rather than doing a scan to find that tuple for every single query you execute, maybe if you could combine them together and then jump to the tuple once, then do whatever it is that you want to compute, that would be way faster. But it can't do that because it doesn't know what the query you're actually going to execute. So another example of this would be uh, you actually can construct queries from, um, from strings like, I, I can append a bunch of strings together and make, make a query and then invoke that. So that one you can't, you can't optimize at all because you just don't know what it's going to be until you actually run it. The, the next issue is going to be that the, um, again, for really complex UDFs, uh, you, you're not going to be able to paralyze them because you have to then invoke that function and it's going to run that as a single thread. And so the, in the case of SQL Server, and it's probably true for the other commercial systems, I just don't know this, um, if, you're, if your query has a UDF, they're going to execute that with a single thread. They don't actually let you execute in parallel. Even though you could maybe possibly do this for every single customer, uh, execute in parallel. But because uh, there might be weird correlations between the, the different UDFs that you're calling, you have to execute them in a the single thread. All right? The last issue is going to be... Uh, Again, well, this is how we said this too. We, we are before cross statement optimizations. So, at least in the case of SQL Server, they were actually trying to speed these things up by actually compiling the code to, to the, the set of interpreting the, the, the UDF, actually compile it to machine code and invoke that. That'll get you a little bit of improvement, but it's still not going to solve all these other problems of like query optimizer, pro, like because it doesn't know what the cost of these things are. It can't optimize across multiple queries within the same UDF. So, just because you can compile this to machine code doesn't mean it's going to go any faster. Postgres actually does the worst thing, in my opinion, but it's, it's, it, it makes sense from an engineering standpoint that it was easy to implement, but it's, from a performance standpoint, it's bad. So going back here, right, this thing is a query, 
right? This is just taking the sum and storing it to the total variable here. So we execute that as a query. That's fine. All of these things you could just interpret, right? If total is greater than, than, than 10, 1 million, then go down this, otherwise go to that. The way Postgres does it, it converts all of these guys into select statements, right? So this would be a table of select, select total greater than uh, 1 million, you know, return true or false. And then sends that to the query optimizer, and then which then turns into a query plan, and then invokes it in the engine, and then gets back the result. So for every single one of these, these lines here, that's another select statement in Postgres. And again, they make sense from an engineering standpoint because rather than having your own separate interpreter interpret this, you know, these, these operations, these commands, you just let the, let the data, data system do it for you because you already have a good engine there. But that means that's multiple round trips going from your UDF into the optimizer again, getting back results. And if that, you know, if that query you're invoking then invokes another UDF, then you have all these recursive calls, right? So how bad is it? So this is an example from uh, the guy that wrote the Freud paper. He, he sent me his slides. So this is, TPC, uh, this is TPCH query 12, and they modified it to have a, uh, a, a user-defined function. So they're just going to do a lookup for the, the customer and go grab the, 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 the customer name from the key, right? So this thing is invoking the simple function here. So all this is doing is just getting the, the customer key and is doing lookup in the customer table, right? And every customer, as far as I know in TPCH, every customer is going to have uh, is going to have a customer name. So this thing's always going to evaluate to true. So for every single customer, you're going to go invoke this function that's going to invoke this other query here, right? So this normally doesn't happen in TPCH. He just he he just added this. So the original query uh, running at scale factor one, so it's a one gigabyte database. Uh, the original query takes 0 0.8 seconds. If you add this UDF, right, that's doing this really simple lookup. Then now you're up to 13 hours, right? Because again, for every single tube, every single tube is going to see, it then does this other lookup. Um, I'm actually surprised it took that long. Uh, but again, this is just showing you how bad this actually is. We'll see, uh, we'll see later in, in a second with Freud, but Freud can do the inlining of this function inside of this, it's, you know, the, the, the outer query, and it can get it down to 0 0.9 seconds. That's why I'm saying this is such a big deal, right? If, you, if, you, if your application had this stupid UDF in it for whatever reason, right, the performance would be terrible. So if you remove it and you get back down to the 0 0.8 performance, but Freud can keep your application exactly as it was and almost match what, what you would have without this UDF. And that's why I think this, this, this is amazing. All right, so let's talk about the history of, of UDFs in SQL Server, see how we end, they ended up with getting to Freud. So, UDFs were first added by Microsoft in SQL Server in uh, 2001. Um, and then in 2008, people started to realize or had problems with UDFs and how it would wreck performance. Right? And there was this blog article from a well-known SQL Server DBA where he said, you know, these UDFs are considered evil personified, right? So it's sort of everyone knew that, that these things were problematic uh, in industry. But Microsoft really didn't say anything until 2010 when they acknowledged, oh yeah, by the way, they are evil, right? Um, and there's a blog article, I think they referenced in the paper from a, it was from, it's from Microsoft that says, oh yes, UDFs are bad. And the guy even says like, yes, UDFs are evil personified. Um, the problem is when you go to the URL now, it looks like they took it down or, and there's no copy on archive.org. So I can't find the blog article anymore. Um, when I post the slides, you can click the link to this that this thing is image is linked to, and it'll it'll take you to this page. So I don't know whether this is just like the, the whether Microsoft marketing realized that oh we we now fix our UDS, let's go remove all this other stuff. Um, but it, it would have been nice to be able to still see that. And Google doesn't have Google doesn't have a cache, which is disappointing. All right, so 2010 people realized that UDFs are problematic, but again, everyone's using them because it's a nice programming abstraction for, for developers, right? Like instead of having to cobble some funky uh, SQL, SQL statement to do exactly what you want to do, you can write a little T-SQL and, and you know, do more complex things and just have your query invoke that. So now the, uh, the author of the Freud paper is this guy, Karthik. He was a PhD student at IIT Mumbai, and he did some early work on seeing how you can decorrelate UDFs and do some early inlining. Uh, so this is a precursor to what, what Freud was doing. 
Um, so he has an ICD paper. This is really good early work in this area. But then he graduates, he finishes his thesis, and he goes and joins Microsoft at the Jim Gray Lab in, in Madison. Um, and he starts the Freud Project in 2015. It was sort of an like early initial prototype, but then it sort of snowballed and it got bigger and bigger, got more people involved in it. Um, and then it got so good that by 2018, they added Freud now to SQL, SQL Server 2019. So I think, I think, I don't actually know if 2019 has been released yet, but like they have a, uh, you know, early um, preview version that's available that actually has this thing in it. Um, and you can go actually look at the documentation that talks about like how to actually use this. Um, so it's in SQL Server and in the Azure SQL database, right? So that's pretty crazy to think that like this guy went from uh, like graduating in 2014, starting the project in 2015, and then within two years is actually you now hardened and up and, and it's so good that they put a lot of energy in to get this into production, right? So that, that the turnaround time from research to, 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 to running production was really short here. And it's amazing. And again, database systems are usually very conservative. Like you don't want people to have, um, like you don't want to put out a new feature and then have half your customers have really good performance and another half get, get, get regress. There are some regressions. We'll, we'll see some, uh, some results at the end. But to go from here to here in, in a short amount of time is amazing. All right? So kudos to him. And obviously, Freud is like the internal research name of this, this project. It's, you know, if you go back to this thing, Freud's not mentioned any here, anywhere here. Because, you know, it's like Hecaton. They don't, Hecaton was the internal name. All the researchers know, know, to, know the project called Hecaton, but it's not called that in the product name. Okay, so what is Freud actually doing? Freud is a technique for automatically converting UDFs into to relational algebra expressions that we can then embed inside of the query that's calling the UDF. So no longer are we, going to do, are we going to treat the UDF as a black box, right? And it's just this function call that we make and it produces some output. We can actually now reason about what the UDF is going to do and optimize for it because we're now going to embed it as a, uh, treating as a first class entity in, as, of a relational expression in our query plan, right? And again, the great thing about this is like you don't have to change anything in your application code. So whatever UDF you were throwing at SQL Server in the 2016 version, now when you throw it at the 2019 version, it gets automatically sped up, right? Assuming it's the right thing. So the paper talks about, uh, actually I really like the paper too because it's also very easy to read. It's like, they don't go into the nitty gritty details about the PL stuff, which I don't care about. I assume, you, you know, someone could figure it out, but for our purposes, we don't care. Uh, they talk about how they decided to actually put the Freud transformation process in the sort of query rewriting or binder phase before you get to the cost-based query optimizer. And the idea here was that these are all sort of static transformation rules. There's some he simple heuristics you can use to decide whether it's okay to transform something or not, like depending on how, how far nesting or how deep you want to go in nesting. But you can do this without having to bring in the cost-based query optimizer, and therefore you don't have to modify that part of SQL Server. You sort of have this shim layer in between like maybe the binder and the query optimizer where you do the rewriting, inline everything, and then now when you throw it to the query optimizer, it just looks like any other query plan. And the optimizer can do all the optimizations that, that, that it can normally do. So there's one team in the class here that's actually doing, want to do sort of the similar thing, but they want to do this at, you know, they're rewriting expressions. So they're doing it in between the binder and the query optimizer where you don't need a cost model, right? So we'll talk about more about how to do these transformation rules for uh, subqueries. I mean, I'll talk briefly about it in the next slide, but we'll cover these more when we talk about query optimization at the end of the semester. But the bottom line is that the commercial systems have really, really good uh, techniques for unnesting subqueries to make them be more efficient. Like worst case scenario for a subquery was essentially what the UDS were doing was for every single tuple you call the subquery. But you can do some rewriting in some cases to actually maybe convert it to a join and then now we know how to optimize joins efficiently so we can, we can run that. So that's why, they, that's essentially what we're the goal we're trying to do here is we're, when we want to convert everything into subqueries using the apply operator or lateral join, and then now we've handed that off to the query optimizer that we then can rewrite that to be a join query, right? So again, Freud just does the transformation. It doesn't worry about uh, any of the, the, the higher level query optimization techniques that the optimizer does. All right, so subqueries. So again, we'll cover subqueries in more detail when we talk about um, 
uh, query optimization later in the semester. But the basic idea is that uh, we can just sort of treat the way uh, a subquery as almost like a function, the same way UDF is. But to avoid having to call for every single tuple, there's two techniques to unnest it. The first one is to read write it and decorrelate it into uh, to a single query, a single level query with joins. The other approach is to decompose it, to move it out, to execute it before you execute the first the, the, the main query, store its result to a subtable, and then do a join between that, sorry, that join, take the, the, the inner query, store its result in a temporary table, then do a join between the temporary table and the original query, and then throw away the temporary table when you're done. All right, so I won't talk about this, but I'll talk about this one very briefly. All right, so say we have a simple example here. We want to get uh, all the sailors that reserved a boat on, a, uh, on this day here. So think of this as, as a sample application where we're keeping track of, of sailors and what boats they rent and what day they do, right? So when nest a query here, it says, for every single uh, sailor in the sailor table in our adder query, return true if there exists a reservation for that sailor on this particular day. Right, so the only thing we really care about in this inner query here is do we have a match for whatever tuple we're looking at in the outer query? So think of like a for loop iterating over every single sailor in the outer table and running this query. Of course, that would be slow. So instead, we can just rewrite this part here because we see that this, you know, this is essentially a join, right? Does something from one table equal something in another table? And we can easily rewrite that like this, right? So that, again, this is what the query optimizer is going to do after we do Freud. Right, this is why we want to get things into, into to, to nested queries. Now, I should have shown an example of this. I, I ran out of time, so I apologize. But they talk about this apply operator in the paper. Right? The, as far as I know, I, actually, I should have checked the SQL standard. The, in other systems, they're called lateral joins. In SQL Server, they're called, uh, it's called the apply operator. I think the standard might be actually apply, whereas in Postgres or, or Oracle, you have to have this lateral keyword. The basic idea is that, in my example here, I had the, the inner query in the where clause, but if you want to have it in the from clause, you need to add this lateral join operator or this uh, the apply you know, keyword operator that allows you to have one query reference the data, uh, the inner query reference the tuples from the outer query. So in my example here, because I was in the where clause, I know what tuple I'm looking at because I'm because I'm essentially doing a for loop overside over the sailor table, so I can reference it inside of here. But if I put it in the in the from if I put it in the from clause, I'm not iterating over the the outer table. I'm sort of looking at the two tables in 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 total by themselves. So I can't can't correlate you know one tuple from you know one tuple here from one tuple there. I'm looking at everything. So that's essentially what the the, the lateral join of the apply operator does. Essentially, you have a for loop over the over one table and do the same thing we did before in, in the where clause in, in my, my last example. Does that make sense? I'm seeing blank faces. All right, the details of it doesn't matter, but like it's just think of like for loops, like two nested for loops, and you're you're allowed to um, you're allowed to match in the inner inner for loop with a tuple in the outer for loop. And it, it, you normally would not be able to do that unless you had this lateral or apply keyword. Okay, so what is Freud, how does Freud work? So there's five steps. The first step, we're gonna transform the statements, put it into the form that, uh, uh, put it into essentially the, the T SQL into SQL statements, and then we're gonna break our UDF up into regions, and now we can reason about each e region individually. Then we're gonna merge the expressions uh, for these different regions into a single SQL statement, and then we inline that merge region into our outer query then we're done and we, and we run through our query optimizer. So I'm gonna walk through an example one by one and show what's going on in each step. And again, the PL semantics of this, PL aspect of this, I don't care about, right? And we're, we're also gonna operate on SQL because that's easier to read as, as humans as we, we should go through our examples. But in the actual system, the actual implementation, they're not doing transformation on SQL statements, they're doing transformations on the low level relational operators, relational expressions, okay? All right, so first step. We're going to transform the statement. So again, we have these UDFs in T SQL. It could be in PLPG SQL or PL SQL. It doesn't matter. They do in T SQL. It's fine. And so this, these are all not valid SQL statements, right? 
So we need to convert these into valid SQL statements that we can then combine together when we do our transformation. Right? So in the first case here, set variable level equal platinum. What they're going to do is just convert that to a select statement where we assign the value uh, platinum to a, a variable called level. So it's almost like a one-to-one -one correspondence. Right? For every single variable I have referenced here, I'll generate a, an output attribute for my select statement over there. Next one, we have a uh, taking the output of, of this summation and assigning it to this variable here. Again, that's essentially the same thing. We can compute this inner query here, right? In a this is technically a the outer query is a tableless select statement. Right? There's no from clause here. We're just taking the output of this computation and assigning it to this attribute here. Last one we have if total is greater than a million, set set it to level, right? We can rewrite this to be a case statement. Case when total greater than 1 million, then output platinum, otherwise null. Right? I'm, I'm showing null here because there's nothing else that comes after this. All right? And again, this is a table to select. We're doing this computation without having to do any table. Right? We assume that this total value is going to come from somewhere else. Right? It's going to come up from up, up here. Um, actually, that should be V. Yeah, whatever. We, we, like, we should compute this. We're gonna, this is going to come from something else, not from, from a tuple we're actually examining, because there is no table here. Okay? All right, so again, this converts all the T-SQL statements into select statements, or into, into SQL. Then we can now break these, uh, the, break up the, 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 the UDF into these different regions and generate the corresponding SQL for, for each region. All right, so the first one here. We declare two variables, uh, total and float, and then we assign um, the summation in, into total, right? So we're going to create a new synthetic table, right? ER1, right? And then the it's just the same thing as before. We're taking the output of uh, of our total and assigning that to the, the the total variable here. And at this point here, we have not assigned anything to level, so we'll make level be just null. All right. Get to the second region. That's what we just we showed in the last slide. Uh, in this case here, since we know we're assigning level to something inside of this 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 inside of this this branch inside the, the the if statement here, that means that in our case statement we had that computation before. We're now we're getting the total here from up up above, right? So E R one comes from here. So we can do that check to see whether total is greater than, than a million. Then send it to platinum. Otherwise, we're going to set it to er1.level, meaning we, we didn't assign level in this. Unless we go down this if clause, we're not going to assign level. So it should be whatever it was up here. But in the first select statement for the first region, we just set it to null. And we're done. Right? Same thing with the last one here. Um, else, otherwise, set it to level. Um, for this one, for simplicity, I'm just sharing, say, if, if er1.total is less than less than or equal to the 1 million, which is the else clause, then we set it to, to be regular. Otherwise, it's just whatever this is. But we, we know, in reasoning about the total uh, logic of this UDF, that if we don't go down, down if, this if clause, we're always going to go down here. Now, whether or not they actually rewrite this to be like this or not, or whether it just should just be you know, a select statement that immediately assigns this thing to regular, I don't know. The, the, the example wasn't clear. The last region here is, is the, the return on the value of level. So our purpose is here, um, we're, we're going to see this later on when we actually combine all these together and to merge them into a single expression. But the paper talks about how uh, you could have multiple return clauses uh, that return values at different points of the UDF, and you need to account for all of them. In our case, it's really simple because it's either we know exactly where to go down this path and always hit this one. But we could have had the return inside of here, and then they have to, again, reason about uh, Making sure they always, re you know, return the, the the right value, and so essentially they just create an implicit return variable. Uh, or, uh, they create an implicit variable called return value, and then they just assign it the same way they're assigning the other values in the select statements. All right, so now we have a bunch, bunch of these uh, uh, select statements for our, each of our regions. So we want to merge these together. So this is where the the, the lateral uh, join operator or the, the cross apply from from SQL Server. This is where this comes together. So this is where we're going to allow the 
in this case here, we're going to cross apply or, or lateral join ER1 with ER2. And because we're in the from clause, I would not normally be able to have, in the second query, reference anything from the, the, the first query here, right, on the other side of the lateral join. But because I have this cross apply or lateral join, I'm allowed to do that. So that's why I can see inside this query the value of, of, a, of an attribute that was defined or set up above. Yes? Uh, then in the last block, shouldn't it be taking it from ER2 level? This question is the last block should be taking it from ER2 dot level. Uh, yes, you're right. Yes, yeah, that's a typo. Yes. Yeah, so he's saying this should be ER2 because you need to get it from whatever this thing set, not what this got set. Um, and actually, that's, that's a typo too. That should be, that should be less than equal to. Um, Yeah. So yeah. So his statement is: it, it should be that the 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 region, the all the variables you look at in one region should depend on the region that came be immediately before. It because again, normally this would be executed sequentially. So yeah, you're right. So this thing should depend on this, and this depends on that. Yes. So that should be that should be er two. Right. Actually, the one thing I don't really understand too is, and I emailed him, he didn't respond though. Um, in this case here, like I didn't understand why, why does this have to be, um, I guess this has to be the inverse, because you don't, you need to know whether this thing would be, is actually set or not. But like in theory, you could take all of this, right? If you didn't have any if clause, you know, if else, why, why not be able to embed that here inside the elf clause and just only have one, you know, one region cover both of them. I, I don't know why that's why he did it that way. Okay. So again, we use the cross apply, the lateral join, to allow us to, ex to execute these things one region after another and be able to get the data that, that came from the previous one. All right, so now you see at the very top, we have our, our for region four was that return statement. Now this is where we're actually going to return things, right? Because the only thing we we care about at the end is what was the output of this you know, final query here. So whatever e ER3 level is, that's what we're gonna re that's our return value up there. So that's where region that's where the final region went. Right? Whereas all these these inner ones are are you know the region one, region two, region three. All right. So now that we have this giant SQL statement, now we just can inline it into our original query. So our original query was for every single customer, go compete their customer level. So we just want to take, replace this thing here with that query I showed in the last slide, right? And we're just treating that as a, again, as, as, a, as, a, as a nested query or a subquery. We just plop it inside of there, right? And then now again, you, you see all the different regions inside of it. So now, now we just throw this through the optimizer. Because it's just, this is just a more complex SQL statement. Right? There's nothing, at this point, there's nothing fancy. There's no notion of a UDF. We just take this and shove it to the query optimizer and, and let it do its thing. And then as I said, the query optimizer has a combination of, of cost-based uh, search, but also has a bunch of rewrite rules to allow them to reason about the, what's in the select statement and do more complicated things. So you can basically take this complicated uh, you know, giant select statement with what, one, two, three, four, five, six, six select statements, and rewrite this into a single or two a, a select statement with just one nested select statement. So these two are equivalent, and that produces the exact same answer. And this is obviously way more efficient to execute because now I just have this little you know inner query here where I'm doing uh, I'm computing the total amount of, of of items bought for every single customer, and I'm you know grouping by the customer key. That gets materialized as a temporary table. And then now I just do my join on the customer based on this thing here. And that's way more efficient than we had before. We were, we were, for every single customer, we were invoking you know, this, this, this summation every single time. So we compute this once for all customers, do that efficiently with a sequential scan the way we, way we talked about before, materialize the results, do the join, which we'll talk about next, next class, and then we're done. So I, I don't remember seeing any, uh, they, were, they didn't have any numbers for this particular example here. But you know, in the paper, they talk about you know, seeing, again, up to 500, 800x improvement for, for some UDS. 
right? It should, should, should be obvious for you, right? Like, uh, we don't have any function calls. We can now run this in parallel very efficiently. Uh, there's, you know, we can now reason about the, um, what the UDF is actually doing because we know, you know, in our, in our SQL what it's trying to do. So we can have, a, you know, the cost model for our query optimizer, pick the best plan based on the data layout, the data location, all the things we want our data system to do for our SQL statements we can do because we're not embedded as a UDF. No one's excited about this as much as I am, or is this so like, so like uh, who cares? All right. Um, I mean, I'll talk about, like, we try to optimize UDFs here at, at CMU. So with the way, way we were gonna do it, we were gonna actually, in the same way that we would generate, uh, you know, ex machine code through the LLVM for SQL, we were doing the same thing for UDFs. But we were just taking whatever the UDF was and just inlining the machine code directly inside the, 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 the machine code of the query. But we can't, we can't do any of the query optimization stuff that they can do, right? We would just not have the overhead of interpreting or make function calls. Whereas this thing is like, again, this is, this is, this is a big deal. Okay. So beyond what we, the five steps we talked about here, you also get some other cool aspects of, of, of optimizations, uh, because everything's being inlined as a query. So you can actually get all sort of like, some of the classic optimizations that a regular, you know, programming language compiler for imperative languages will give you, the the SQL Server query optimizer will give you that as well. Again, without having to change anything in Freud or having to change anything in your application. So, say we have a really simple UDF that just says, uh, for a given value, tell you, you know, given as an integer, see whether the value is greater than a thousand, return high. If the value is, is less than that, return low. And then you prepend that or append that the the, that result here with the, with the string value and return that. So let's say we have a really simple query that says select get val and pass in 5,000. So again, we would already have a cache query plan for this that we could then inline into, into this query plan, all right? And then we throw it at, at the query optimizer and the rewriter to let it do whatever it wants to do to optimize it further, right? So. The first thing you see, again, we, we take this, we convert this in, uh, into uh, a Freud statement, which is again, it's just a select statement doing the, the lateral join between the two of them. So the first optimization we get is dynamic slicing. So this is basically saying, since I know what the value is being passed in as x to this function, I can then chop off or slice out different portions of the, of the, of the, of the program that I know I'm not gonna go down or I'm not gonna need. So since I know the value is 5,000, that can, should, be, should be considered as a high value, so I don't even need, need to include this else clause, and I don't even need to include the if clause. So that, since I know exactly what the value is, I know I can always set val to equal high, right? So and the same thing in, uh, in, in the Freud program, since I know the value is gonna be 5,000, I don't need this case statement anymore, right? I just say select high as val, but again, I'm like hard coding exactly what it is. The next optimization you get is constant propagation and folding. So again here, since I know in my optimized query, whatever the value of this is then gonna be uh, prefixed to the string here, rather than maybe storing that value as a separate variable, then prefixing it, I could just store it directly in the string, right, high.val. So not, I, don't, I don't have to worry about the concatenation of the string, I just take the string, the exact string I need and propagate it, right? Same thing in, in the SQL statement here, since I know that I'm going to take whatever this is, select high as val, and then append it to this guy here to produce high value, I don't even need to do this outer apply. I don't even need to do the join. I just select high value as, as, as the return result. All right? And the last step is just to remove dead code. I don't need to declare this variable high because I'm just always going to create the string high val. So I'll just make it return high value. Same thing in SQL. I don't need to do this nested query here to return high value. You know, select high value as return val, and that selects return val from this. I don't need any of that. I just select return high value, right? So again, this is awesome. You're getting, like, this is the shit, like, the, like the, the data system will do this for you automatically, right? This is the query rewriting stuff. Like, this, this is not, we don't need any cost model to figure this out. We always know that we, 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 we can do this, so we just do it, right? It's never gonna be bad, as far as I know. Yeah, it's never gonna be bad, so just always do it. 
So rather than having to reason about the UDF code and figure out how to transform it in this way, right, we just get this for free in, in our database system. And that's why, again, that's why I think this is amazing. So what can Fluent support? As of 2019, they support declare, set, selects, if then else, return, exists, not exists, is null, a bunch of other operators here. Um, they talk about it like if you have UDS calling other UDS, like how far do you want to let things recurse? Uh, I forget they, whether they said they, they sort of have a hard coded threshold that allows them to decide when to cut off. Um, there is other aspects of this I think they couldn't support, like the if you have dynamic queries, like if you're generating select statements from, from concatenating strings, then they can't handle that because again, you don't know what the string is going to be before you actually run it in some cases. Um, and they support all SQL data types. Again, they, they support for, for T-SQL, but you can imagine extending this for other programming languages as well, right? Like a lot of systems now let you write, you know, UDS and JavaScript and Java and other things. So converting that into the SQL semantics is slightly tricky, but again, it's not a, it's mostly engineering. It's not a fundamental scientific problem. So let's talk about how good they, uh, how much they can actually help people. So they looked at like some of the, the top, uh, they took the top 100, SQL databases on Azure, looked at their UDS, and they tried to figure out what percentage of the UDS that people are running, you could actually run Freud and have, have Freud generate an a, you know, inline version of this. So they found overall, I think the entire fleet, about 60% of the UDS could be inlineable. That's pretty significant. So 60% 60, 60 of the UDS people, people running in Microsoft Azure are simple enough that Freud would actually work. This is sort of why we stopped the, the the compilation stuff for, for PLPG SQL in our own systems because it'd be hard to beat something like that, right? And the, 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 the simple cases are already sort of taken care of. So then they talk about a bunch of different work, sort of three simple workloads they evaluated. And again, like 84%, 91%, 95%, like a large percentage of these, uh, of the UDFs that people are actually running in the real system, you can actually optimize with Freud. And that, that's pretty awesome. All right, so then they actually did a, an evaluation of what the, what the benefit's going to be. And so these are sorted in, uh, based on the order of what the benefit's going to get. And this is in log scale. And this is just showing the, that, like, again, you have some UDS for these, for these two particular workloads where you can get, like, 800x improvement over what the original version could do. Like, again, like, when do you ever see that in computer science? Almost never. Like, architecture guys are lucky to squeak out 1% improvement. And then that's a big deal, right? To get 800x, like, without changing anything in the application, without buying new hardware, just purely through software, that's, that's amazing. You never see that, right? So there are some examples here, though. You see uh, 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 the, the tail end that there are some, uh, some UDS where actually you're getting worse performance. I forget the reason why they said. Um, but it's not to say that this thing's magical to solve all the world's problems. But in, in my opinion, the, the benefit you're getting from this, this end of the tail versus that end uh, is totally worth it. Some people got screwed, but who cares? Like, look, look how much better you're, uh, you're on average overall. Right? So again, I, I mean, I've, I've already been sort of saying this entire thing, right? You, you never see this kind of thing. Um, the... Again, the other approach we talked about was compiling UDF into machine code. Again, this is nice to do. It's orthogonal to, in some ways, to what Freud is doing. Like you could, you could still want to do maybe the inlining, and then you then can compile that inline version. Um, Freud is the right way to do this, in my opinion. There's a patent for Microsoft, so no one else is going to be doing this. Or maybe I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to speak about these things, but. Uh, this, this, to me, this is quite significant, and it'd be interesting to see how other people, other systems try to approach the same problem. All right? The compilation will help a little bit, but not in the same, the same scale that we saw before in the last slide. All right, so that was sort of rush, but any questions about Freud, what we're doing? Again, this doesn't really fit into the narrative of things we're talking about, because the next class we're going to talk about hash joins. Uh, but again, in my opinion, this is, this is, this is worth knowing about. All right, so in our remaining time, uh, I want to talk about uh, <laughs> life lessons for working in code. I don't know why I put him. I just I I, I need to put something there. Um, I didn't want to put a d so I put that. Um, what's that? What's that? Sorry. I guess like 
this is a large project and this country is also a large project. But that, That's collaborative. Yeah, but he has like, you know, torture chambers and like that, right? It's not, uh, it's a bit. Uh, Oh, all right, all right, all right. We need to work together as a team, right? That, there we go. That's what it is. For the people. All right. So, again, just as a disclaimer, like, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, I don't want you to have the, take away the impression that I'm saying, the things I'm saying here is exactly what you should be doing. I and mean, if you're not doing, you're failing, or, or not, you're not, you're not, you're not going to be, you're not going to be successful, you're not, you're going to have trouble working on systems. These are things that I've sort of figured out in my own uh, time on this earth about, like, how to actually approach large source code. And this is through either working on now two and a half databases, right? So, th so the th is a half one at this point. Well, it'll be three soon. Um, but I also worked before I did my PhD. I worked on Condor, which is a major distributed batch processing batch processing system. Um, I've also done you know sort of legal work where you, they give you a bunch of source code and you have to read it and try to figure out what's going on, right? Uh, and you can't talk to developers because it's you, you have to do everything on your own. So like. These are things that like I've sort of think that I've learned that help me work on large code bases and understand what's going on and sort of impart them onto you guys so that when you go forward in your projects, in the back of your mind you think, well, this is not making sense, what's going on? Uh, you can sort of try some of these tricks. Now, fortunate enough that for you guys, all the people that have been working on the system since we started rewriting it are still here at CMU. Right? Wan's still here, Tian Yu's still here, Matt's still here, right? But like Years from now, you maybe go off to a company, uh, or the people next year would take this class. You know, they'll be looking at your code, and you'll be gone, and they can't call you and ask you. So I think it's, it's very important to try to work independently, right? Because it's very unlikely that, like, going out through your life, that you're ever going to be working on a database system or any system from scratch. Like, no one's going to hire you, and from day one, you sit down and start writing, like, you know, the main function and start, you know, something from brand new. Um, and even if you do that, you know, chances are you're going to be using third-party libraries. Right and and other packages, because you don't want to write you know you don't want to write you know you know command line flag parsing yourself. There's packages to do this for you, and then now you got to go understand what those things are doing. So these these are sort of general rules I think that, that help you you know navigate complex software. The other thing I also say too is like when I talk to to my friends in database companies and I said you know I'm teaching a database class, what things do you want me to cover in the class? Like you want to you want me to cover B plus trees, locking techniques, like what do you care about? And they all pretty much said the same thing without me telling them what the other, other people said. They all said they want to hire students that can work on large source code independently. Right? They want to hire someone you know, and go through the, you know, the bootstrapping phase or the, the onboarding phase and can then start making uh, you know, contributions to the source code without having to bother everyone else on the team. Right? So that's, again, these, these are why I think these things are really important. So the dumbest thing to do, the most wasteful the most biggest waste of your time is to do what I'll call passive reading. And this is basically where you say you're just going to read the source code for the sake of reading the source code to try to figure out what's going on. So a lot of times I'll have students email me, they say, oh, I, I want to come work at, you know, on, on your database system at CMU as an intern, or I want to you know, get started on a project, and they'll tell me, oh, I've been reading the source code for the last two weeks. Right? And I'm like, why? It's a, it's a, you're not going to get anything out of it. right? Because unless you're going in and reading something for, to, for a specific purpose, you just reading to say, oh, this calls this, this calls that. Like you're just not going to absorb it because you're not really trying to solve any particular problem. You're just trying to under, you know build a mental model of what's actually going on. So this is like the worst thing you could possibly do. I do not recommend this, right? Um, and I think it's really important to just to, 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 to get your you know, your hands dirty or your feet wet or whatever metaphor you want to use and start getting jumping into the source code and doing something even if it's small to get started on it because then you go through the whole process of actually how to build it, how to test it, and things like that. So the easiest way to do this is actually to write test cases. Now you may think, oh, that's boring. I don't, I, you know, who wants to write test cases? Like you're going to go out in the real world and write the test cases, right? Uh, even if they have a QA team that does a lot of testing for you, right? They're going to want you to do some initial testing before you hand it off, right? Like no code you're, you're going to write is going to be, you know, the holy gospel. Like it's never going to have any bugs. So you have to write test cases, and so. One way to get started understanding the source code is maybe there's something that a part of the system you want to understand. You can write a test case that sort of tests your assumptions about what you understand that piece of the code is doing and seeing whether that matches up with what the test case actually does. And what's nice about writing test cases, unless you're doing it wrong, uh, it should be independent of the actual implementation of the thing you're testing. 
So you can't break it. Right? If your test case fails, who cares? Because like, you break your test case, that doesn't affect the rest of the system. Now, if you go add in special test-only functions into the system to get some data out, then that's a software engineering mistake. You should not do that. You should be able to have enough APIs or get enough data or information about what the component is doing through its existing APIs that allow you to write the interesting tests you want. And this could be either unit tests or high-level tests, like a SQL regression test, right? And again, you will make a lot of friends right away if you go ahead and write tests. Like when you first start up and say, all right, you started a company. Oh, I want to help you guys write some tests. They're going to love you. Right? Uh, they may try to give more tests to you, and that may or may not be what you want to do. Um, but this is a good way to get started on something uh, you know, right, right away. The next uh, thing you can do uh, is do refactoring. So the idea here is that you find a piece of code that you want to start working on, and of course, it's not going to be up to the standard that you would write. So maybe you want to start doing some refactoring and to help improve it, make it a little bit cleaner. Right? And this can be just sort of adding comments and explaining what the complex operations are doing. Um, you can maybe clean up messy code, refactoring you know, the, the redundant code, maybe breaking out to separate functions. Right? The idea here is that you're not, again, you're not really changing the logic of the application or, or the system. You're just making it a little bit more easier, easier to maintain and understand for other people. Again, the idea, you don't want to break anything at this point because you don't really understand what's going on. So maybe it's implicit assumptions you, about the system you're not seeing in the port, part of the code you want to write or you're going to modify. So adding comments is, is a nice way to say, all right, let, let, me, let me put my stamp down, explain what's going on without changing you know, what calls what or whatnot. Right? The other thing that's important to do also too is actually build it. It sounds sort of trivial, right? Like to, 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 to build the software, of course I want to do that, right? But it's more than just maybe running make, but actually going through the, the entire process of like getting it deployed on whatever build infrastructure that they have, sending a pull request, right? going through the, the whole testing process. Because right? then that, that'll get you to understand what, what are the assumptions people are making about how the software is going to be run, what data is going to be given as its input, right? how, what environments you expect this thing to run in. There might be a document, you know, document internally we sort of have our own here, but you know, other companies, same thing, that explains exactly what our testing infrastructure looks like, but it's not really until you actually go and do it where you actually understand what's going on. Right? And of course, if the documentation is not available for either, it's sort of like the comments. If there, there aren't comments available, there aren't documentation in the source code to explain what some complex piece of the system is doing, if you write it, people will love you. Uh, same thing with the build process. If it doesn't exist, maybe take a first stab at writing it. It, again, it, it'll help you understand it better if you have to explain it to other people. Right? All right, so any questions about this? Again, these, so I think just sitting down and reading software is not the way to go. Now, our system, the current system is small enough where it's not all these weird dependencies of, of, of you know, of a bunch of source code that already exists. Many of you guys are working on projects using source code that, that you have to write that doesn't exist yet, but you're using pieces of the system that maybe have not been designed in the way that you expect them or, or assume the way that you're actually going to use them. I think all of you are probably in this boat, right? Um, so in this case here, I think the, this is why we ask you guys to write the design documents by writing down exactly how you think you're going to modify the system, what files you think you're going to need to add and to modify, right? get to that level, then you can understand how what the big picture of the system is going to be. You're never going to be able to understand all the in, in, individual components of a database system or any other system. But if you want to you, you understand at a high level how the thing is sort of interconnected, so that you know you know what's the right place I need to add this piece, what's the right place I need to modify to do this, right? So I'll give an example. I, I'm, I'm not trying to disparage the team from last year, but the, we had another team do do query rewriting the same way um, that one team is doing this semester. And it's sort of like the rewriting stuff we talked about here. So they were doing rewriting in the SQL parser, the query optimizer, and then an extra little shim layer that they wrote themselves. So they're doing this rewriting in like three different parts. And that would be really confusing if, you, if, if you, your SQL query shows up, and then when you see the query plan, it looks different than what you threw in. You say, oh, well, it must be doing query rewriting. Let me go figure out where that's actually happening. And you got to look in three different places to see where that is, right? So that's an example where maybe they didn't have a full understanding of what the right place was to actually do query writing, so they did it wherever they thought it was actually feasible, easy to do. And from an engineering standpoint, that's, that's easier for them to write, but from a maintain, maintainability standpoint, that's difficult for other people to do, to handle. 
Okay, so as I'm saying, this is sort of, you want to tread lightly in making big changes and make sure you have a good understanding of what's actually going on in the system. So writing test cases, writing some documentation, and actually just going through the build process and see all the different pieces that fit together uh, is, a, is a good first step. Okay? All right, so uh, what's going to happen? So next week, we're going to have these separate status meetings. So I've already met with some of you. Uh, some of you I'm meeting with this week, some of me we'll, we'll, we schedule things for next week, but I'll send an email for everyone who hasn't met with me yet. The idea is that next week we'll meet one-on-one -on -one with your team for like 10, 15 minutes. You guys tell me what you're doing, what problems you're facing, where, you're, where the current status is of the project, and then we'll sort of figure out what you need to talk about when we have our presentations about the status update for the project on April 8th, right? The other thing that also happens on April 8th is that you want to send a pull request on GitHub to our, our repository for the other team that you'll be assigned to to, to review. So I'll have instructions uh, to say what, how you're actually going to do, do this review process. But the idea is that you'll be teamed up with another team. You submit your pull request to them. They submit their pull request to, to, to you. And then you guys both review it, provide feedback about the code they've written. And then, uh, and then a week later, and then you take their, their changes, their suggestions, and you try to apply them to your, to your source code where, where appropriate. If right, someone says something stupid, we, we just ignore that. Okay? All right, so again, I will send an email about the status updates, about those meetings next week, and then, again, you should be planning for two weeks from now having the, the, the status presentations. Same thing, everyone gets five minutes. We'll go in reverse order than we did last time. Uh, so I think who, who, was, who went last last time? Yeah, so you, you guys go first. All right, so, and that'll, that'll be two weeks from now. Okay? All right, next class, we're doing hash joins. So we'll discuss hash tables, hash functions, and then actually how to do a parallel hash join. Okay? All right, guys. See you on what's today. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.